please welcome to the stage Brex co-founder and co-CEO Enrique Dubregra and Piermont Bank founder and CEO Wendy Kai Lee with Bloomberg's Tom Giles. Right. Wendy, Enrique, thanks for joining me today. We're here to talk about a few things that changed between startups and financial services firms a couple of months ago. I want you all to hearken back to where you were in early March. Second week of March, if you were a startup, you were probably wondering how you were going to make payroll. If you were a venture capital firm, you were probably advising your startups to take the money and run. Um, we, uh, we actually, I'm going to start with you, Enrique. We had a conversation with you that weekend about the impact on companies like yours. Um, some of the things that you told us at the time, um, Brex had received more than a billion in payroll loan requests just on that Thursday, that critical Thursday when people started vacating uh, Silicon Valley Bank. You saw record inflows of money being deposited. Um, Talk a little bit more about that weekend, and can you kind of quantify a little bit more from us now that the dust has settled? Um, what kind of impact the problems in the regional banks had, and what kind of impact that had for you at Brex? Yeah, absolutely. So first, thank you so much for having me. I definitely remember that weekend. It's probably one of the craziest experiences of my professional career. And we first originally um, heard something was happening around Thursday. Uh, and, you know, we had a little bit of our own money there, so we decided to take it out. And we started just seeing the inflow of deposits like we've never seen before. But at that time, you know, it was still just a lot of fear. Um, on Friday, you know, then it was announced what was happening. And we saw a huge rush of people opening accounts with us. And I think one of the reasons uh, we were so popular, people opening accounts, is because we could actually open accounts the same day because a lot of our systems were automated in account opening versus most of the banks would take a few days or a week and if people needed to make payroll on the Monday, it was Friday, weekends, everything, um, it would be hard, right? So we saw um, almost 5,000 account openings that, that weekend, uh, you know, and uh, uh, I think around 3 billion of deposits uh, came over the next, the next week or so. And we didn't know exactly if we were gonna stick or not gonna stick, you know, if people were gonna stay or not stay. Um, actually, uh, most of them actually did stay, which was uh, obviously surprising for us. And I think that it definitely changed the landscape. And I think that the biggest way it changed the landscape is that most customers now don't want to concentrate their relationship in one partner. They actually want to have multiple partners, and I think that's here to stay. Wendy, you're, uh, you have started a digital-only commercial bank you target specifically fintech companies. Can you talk about how, the, how and to what extent did the events of Mar early March 2023 change the way, the way startups, new companies think about their relationship with banks? Yeah, and I think before March 10th, um, banks regulate a banking institution at best was being viewed as a partner. Mostly, it's really a service provider. I think that after March 10th, most of our, at least, tech customers realized that, wait a second, the banking relationship is critical, critical, and that the regulatory environment, I should say the regulators, has immediate and critical impact to their business. It's no longer a couple of steps removed, and that Outside of the banking industry, it's difficult for people, I shouldn't say difficult, I think it's underappreciated that the banking regulators, they're the rule setter, they're the enforcer, they're judge and jury. So it's not like there are rooms for negotiation, for discussion. So if they view, they deem an institution has weakness, they can come in and they did what they did, right? I'm not here to discuss in terms of what's warranted, what's not, and et cetera. I think that's been covered relentlessly. 
but I think it's the relationship that were at one time deemed very indirect, very remote, becomes very real and very critical to them. For both of you, when you look back on that, and when you think about the things that were happening at the banks that, that ended up in receivership, do you look at that and did you, were there takeaways? What were some of the lessons? And were there things that those banks were doing that you have decided we won't do that or we will scale back how much we do that? Um, you wanna go? So, well, Piermont is a regulator bank and we could talk about it as a non-regulator institution. Um, for us, the lesson learned, I think, is a couple of things. One is that the definition of institution that has systemic importance. I think we all know that right now, any banks can create systemic issue and weakness. I think that's a lesson learned for all parties, especially for the regulators. That came as a surprise. Second is really the speed of your deposit that can run out the door. I've said, I think during our call, that if this was 1965, people are lining up outside of every SVB branch, and three o'clock comes around, branch closed, or that we ran out of the cash, and they're waiting for the trucks to deliver the next day, they would have never had 25% cash go out the door within four to six hours. So we're looking at an entirely different landscape, and that also caught everyone by surprise. Not sure why, myself included. We all know that payments, money runs, moves around a lot faster, but I don't think anybody really thought of this from a bank run standpoint. So that's second, so no deposit is safe. And lastly, I would just say that it's the potential regulatory environment swing to the extreme end. So post-08 crisis, we saw that, and we are fully anticipating that. We're already seeing that. Even in the last two weeks, um, the FDIC have issued interagency guidance on how banks should really work with fintech partners and how banks need to treat the end users of a fintech. So all that is gonna create more friction, right, versus taking frictions away. That's gonna create ad adding more costs to doing business with a bank. And it's actually gonna hinder, I think, the speed of product innovation when bank, for those banks that are actively supporting the fintech ecosystem. So the list is actually now short, hate to say that. Yeah, so for us, um, you know, we are not a bank, and uh, I would say that before SVB, we had to explain that a lot, and it was a detractor. It's like, why would I leave money with a non-bank? Um, and after that, it actually became a good thing. Um, and the reason is, banks fundamentally, the business is you deposit your money with a bank, and they are gonna lend out your money. Right, and, um, and the, the concept of a bank run is, well, they lent out your money, um, and then everyone tried to get the, the money all at the same time, and the money was lent out, or was bought in different assets, so there's no money, right? And um, we, we as a non-bank, we don't do that, because we can't, uh, regulatory-wise, and obviously we lose some money by not doing it, but at the same time, uh, you know, if everyone were to take their money out today, all the money would come out because we can't do anything with the money. And I think a lot more customers just got a lot more aware of those dynamics of the difference between a bank and a non-bank, where their money is going. Um, and I think that the increased scrutiny from the customer perspective actually, uh, was, I think it's good for the industry because it does allow customers to understand what risk they're actually taking. And so, I think that, I, I agree that it will probably add regulation and friction to the system, um, but I do think the silver lining is that customer, increased customer education of where their money is going is probably a positive for, for, the, for us. Enrique, I wanna stay with you for just a second. Right before Mart, I think it was in February, you raised a round, a funding round, um, how much runway does that give you? And right now, what are your priorities in terms of how you're allocating resources, both in terms of like your, your target customers, the kinds of products that you're offering? Yeah, absolutely. So um, the last time we, we raised uh, equity money was around uh, May or June 2022. Um, I think in, in aggregate Brex history, raised a little bit over a billion and a half in equity. 
Uh, and you know, what we do disclose is that all the money we raise is enough to get us to cash flow positive and profitability without having to raise uh, any more money. The pace of those investments obviously is a little bit dependent on, on a lot of factors, but uh, you know, we don't expect to raise any more money anytime soon. A lot of our investments have been going into uh, our new software platform, Empower, um, which is a spend management solution, let's say replacing Concur for businesses. So now we can replace Concur, American Express, and do kind of like, uh, you know, a lot of banking services as well. And uh, another big part is on global expansion. We announced recently that we can support customers in over 36 countries, and you know, that number has been growing. So. Uh, those are probably two big areas of investment for us. Uh, Wendy, um, you, when you talk about Piermont, you use the phrase, our mission is to grow as quickly and relevantly as our, as our customers. Again, a lot of them fintechs, obviously not exclusively. Um, you've raised 90 million so far. How far are you from needing to raise again? And what are your spending priorities, your investment priorities? Sure. Well, banks are a little different, right? Um, there's actually such a thing as overcapitalization um, in regulated banks. So we actually don't need to raise as much as probably our fintech counterparts. So we have already turned a profit. Um, the bank's raise capital is to really for asset growth standpoint. It's a leverage point, but we're sitting on a ton of capital as well as cash. So um, yeah, I mean, it's nice not to have to worry about the burn. Yep, yep. Enrique, you talked about that path to profitability, not needing to raise again. Um, Timeline-wise, what are you thinking about um, in terms of how long it's going to take to reach that milestone that you set? Um, and secondly, how are you balancing the kind of advantages of being a publicly traded company against what a lot of the startups tell us are you know, some of the detractors, some of the downsides? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, we absolutely want to be a publicly traded company. We're definitely not in the category of like, oh, we could stay private forever if we could. Uh, I think there's a lot of advantages for a business like ours being publicly traded. That being said, um, I do want to be a low volatility pro publicly traded company because um, I do, don't believe that massive stock swings are good to operate. I think it's very distracting for everyone involved. So I would say that being profitable is probably one of the few things that do reduce volatility um, as being a public stock. So I would say those things are pretty, pretty correlated. Uh, that being said, we're still, even though raise a lot of money, have a high valuation, uh, we're still six years old. So I would expect us to, you know, wait until at least year nine or 10 to do something. Wendy, um, you said you turned a profit seven months ahead of time what are the milestones that you need to see before you can start having the conversation about going, uh, becoming a publicly traded company? Sure. So banks go public for, I think, perhaps a slightly different reason. It's really for having another currency to do M&A more than anything else. So I think in the last, given the events of the last few months, I think that has changed the mind of, frankly, my own investors in terms of not being a publicly listed bank because someone can just short your stock and create a ton of volatility to your operations and to your survival, actually. So um, normally in the past for banks is that you want to get to about a billion and a half in total assets to have a meaningful listing. So that's normal. But for us, it's about being the most profitable commercial bank rather than chasing the asset size at the moment. I want to stay with you, Wendy, for a moment, um, and, this, and this ties back to the SVB question. Um, you are female-founded, female-led, you have a female board chair. More than half of your loans, if, I, if my math is right, are to low and moderate income communities, women and minority-owned businesses. Um, you've talked about the importance of diversity, but right now we're, we're at a time when it's become quite fashionable to be a detractor on DE&I, to say that this is a distraction, to write op-eds for the Wall Street Journal and say maybe that's what got banks, such and such bank, into trouble. Can you talk about, like, why you, do you still think diversity is important and, and why, why is that? Why is it important 
as a business case. And this is the kind of thing that you're gonna have to have conversations with yeah. eventual investors in the public. Yeah, so for us, diversity and supporting minority-owned, women-run, whether it's funds or you know, startups, it wasn't a, it's not an initi initiative. It's very inherently part of our DNA. So it's not something that we said, okay, let's strip out this part of the balance sheet and park this amount of money to support that. I think that's really where it becomes a potentially a distraction in an environment like this. So for us, it has always been built as part of the DNA. So that, that's for one thing. Second is that for us, that's where a, there's a large market share that has not been paid attention by the larger banks. That's the truth, right? And part of that is how do you be relevant? It is very difficult, actually, for legacy banks to move fast and to stay relevant because the processing, the so-called mid and back office, they, they just can't, even if they want to and they recognize the needs, they just cannot move that fast. So then if you make that an, an initiative, then it becomes a real distraction to your operation. But for us, we're naturally built that way, right? So we opened in 2019. Today, we're still the only truly full scope commercial bank got chartered since the financial crisis, which is 2008, right? So when we built this, we spent over nine months reverse engineer the entire how the commercial banks is run. Because people often associate innovation with technology only. But in banking, it's not only technology, right? I always say Jamie Dimon can outspend anyone in technology, right? It's about innovation in process. It's sustainable innovation, right? So being very deliberate to change your product services and how you deliver that. And I think that's really what this is about. I know I'm you know, sort of coming, going off your topic a little bit, but it comes back to that is if, as long as you build something and you have a process that's relevant, then supporting a particular demographic is not a distraction. Does that make sense? Yeah. So it's built, I think, Fundamentally, when you don't have legacy process, legacy issues, it becomes less of a burden when you singularly try to help a particular marketplace. Enrique, does thinking about, does having conversations about diversity, is that something that is a priority for you and you have conversations with your board? How do you, how do you avert the likelihood of it becoming a distraction or somehow a, somehow a problem or part of the rhetoric? Yeah, no, absolutely. So for us, since the beginning of Brex, um, we, uh, as you know, Pedro, my co-founder, and I, we're both Brazilian, we're both immigrants, we came here for college. And one of the first problems we were trying to solve was people who couldn't get credit cards. And you went to the trouble, you found a way to raise millions of dollars in venture capitalists, and then you got to a bank and they wouldn't give you a card. And that made no sense in our head. Like, how is it that I already fought all the challenges up to get millions of dollars in my corporate bank account they still won't give me a credit card and you know we created a super objective metric to assess risk um, that was actually how much money you've raised right so uh, in that way um, it was extremely objective and I think that you know every time we're looking and now we're expanding globally similarly right like a lot of times uh, the international employees of a company they have less uh, it's much harder to be an international employee. They don't get access to corporate cars. They have to take weeks to get their uh, expenses reimbursed. If they have to travel, they have a debit card, it needs to be out of pocket. So we try to like facilitate all of that with all of our products and make the, the world you know, a little bit more global um, in that respect. You are both, both your companies have a lot in common, including leveraging technology to disrupt traditional providers of the services that you, that you are, are out there uh, working on. But we're, not, we're starting to see new entrants, startups like Ramp, big tech players like Apple. How are they, how are you, what are you doing, Wendy, both of you, to both of you, what are you doing to ensure that you stay credible at a time when the barriers to entry seem only to be falling? Well, I think, again, as a regulated institution, it is a little different because the barrier to entry is very, very high. Um, going through the approval, getting FDIC insurance, and getting the bank charter. With that said, from the existing bank population, more and more of them recognize the need to, um, you know, support 
this new innovative ecosystem and they see the deposits opportunity, they see the fee income opportunity, but the issue is that, again, it's regulation, right? And with the banks, the legacy processes, the legacy te technology is often what holds them back. So for me, for Piermont Bank, to answer your question, is continue to be able to stay relevant, which requires the ability to pivot accordingly. Not be, you know, not, not build technology, not build processes that one day I become just one of them, right? And keeping it clean and keeping it simple, so. Yeah, so I think uh, one thing in uh, fintech or, or banking is that it is not a winner-takes-all market. I think this is a pre-COVID stat, but before COVID, there was 44 banks just in the United States that were worth more than $10 billion in market cap. Think about it, it's 44 companies that kind of do the same thing um, that are worth more than $10 billion. And I think it's because there's so much nuance in different sectors, different sizes, different product sets, that I think there's, there's a lot of space for innovation, you know, and disrupting the traditional players. Wendy, Enrique, thanks a lot for joining us. Thank you.